and thank you for inviting me. And particularly, uh, thank you for allowing me to select to choose a topic, because um, you know there's a lot one can talk about at the moment. I thought about talking about the Irish presidency of OSCE. Um, uh, I thought of talking about various aspects of the EU crisis we're looking at in, in the Euro and then the Schengen and onwards. But I, I chose the Arab Spring and the implications for the European neighborhood policy because it is, uh, in my opinion, the most significant development in the second decade of uh, this century. And it ranks with the uh, most significant development in the last decade of the last century. I refer to the um, breakup of the Soviet Union and the enlargement of the European Union. Um, what's happened here in 2010 is a totally new phenomenon, in my opinion. Um, the former Soviet Union, the, the Soviet system collapsed internally, whereas what's happened in the Arab Spring, and the most striking thing about it, is, is the demonstration of people power. Um, these popular uprisings are also very striking in that, one, they're not ideological, they have not been anti-US. They have not been, surprisingly, notably anti-Israel. And um, we have a very interesting development at King's College. About three years ago, we started people, a thing called the Atkins Fellows. And these are 10 fellows from, we chose, they're at doctoral level. We chose them uh, every year. 10 from Arab countries and five from Israel. And we make them work together in our rabbit warren in the basement of the Strand campus. Uh, we have them around the place all the time. And we've, during the Arab Spring, we had some great discussions, as you can imagine, because we had two very good uh, um, uh, Egyptian fellows. And uh, what they used to tell us is, uh, <coughs> this is all about three things, they'd say, fundamentally. Uh, freedom from oppression. They say bread, but by bread we meant a lot of things. It meant jobs, it meant, uh, um, it, it, it meant the economy, it meant a whole lot of things. And, democrat and the third big thing for them were the democratic values. I'm not saying not which type of democracy, but the values of democracy. And it was striking also that all this was brought about not just because of authoritarian regimes, not just because of youth unemployment and food prices and inflation and all the things we talk a lot about, but it was driven by a new phenomenon of the new social dig digital networks. Most popularly, we know them as Twitter, as Facebook, and other forms of digital communication, which those of us who are not as... Um, technologically minded, as, uh, who are more technologically minded, will understand how this development is going at, at a pace. And it has fundamentally changed uh, an awful lot that we have to discuss from now on about popular uprisings. Surprisingly, also, the traditional political parties have played a very small role, hardly there at all. Um, the other movements, like fundamentalist movements, were completely taken by surprise. Al-Qaeda has not been involved, except, as you might expect, to some extent, some evidence of it in the Yemen, but that was to be expected. But it hasn't been a factor in the other uprisings. Um, Egypt was an interesting case in point, because it was not just the unemployed youth. It was the unemployed youth supported by the middle classes. But there is another new phenomenon which they all spoke about, was the influence of Al Jazeera television, which has been a sort of keeping them in touch with what's going on elsewhere in the Arab uprisings. And this has been another new phenomenon. Now, I'm not going to analyze the uprisings, as I think um, it's, the, it's a whole, whole session in itself. And also, um, each country has different there are different characteristics. And you have Rosemary Hollis coming in at, at Thursday week. And I only wish I could be here to listen to Rosemary, because she'll give a very interesting analysis 
of what is going on. And no doubt, I'd love to hear her analysis of the mess we're in in Libya. Um, what I'll try to do is to give um, uh, talk about the European response to these developments. Talk about, first of all, give an overall overall picture. Uh, to talk uh, about the implications for the European neighbourhood policy and to speculate a bit on possible outcomes. Um, Rumsfeld made a famous remark, uh, famous, he used a famous category once of known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Now, this really applies to this situation. <coughs> Somebody, a friend of mine, says it's the only remark he ever made in, in his career which contributed to promoting international peace. But that's pretty hard. Uh, but um, the first um, known known is that nothing's going to be the same. Uh, and that another known known is that people power will, from now on, be a factor that we must politically take into account. Um, a notable known unknown is that nobody knows where this is going. Um, and a big unknown unknown is whatever, what new regional power structures uh, are going to emerge from this. What types of leaders will emerge from this? Uh, you know, one can speculate when we come to write the obituary of the Arab Spring. Um, where will this democracy movement go? Where will it be? Will there be democracy-loving billionaires who've emerged in the Arab world, as we found Soros in the experience of the 1990s, and the Im impact that these democracy-loving billionaires had? <laughs> Um, who will the leaders be? When we look at the history of revolutions, we can't be very encouraging that things necessarily happen very quickly. Um, just think about 58 Hungary. Think about 68 Prague. Or more recently, think about 80, which we would say is Gdansk. They all took many years to reach fruition, and they, the, 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 the people who led these uprisings didn't achieve what they wanted to achieve right away, but certainly they were, they were part of what ended uh, happily in the end. I'd like to focus this talk on, on um, the, particularly on the neighborhood policy. And the first remark I'd make about neighborhood policy is that the most successful neighborhood policy of the European Union was enlargement. Um, and if you look at the, that success, what will strike one, I think, is the soft power of the European Union. And the basis of that soft power was a magnetism of the Union. And you can contrast this with the characteristic of America uh, during the same period, and the American strength was the projection of hard power. Um, I have no doubt that the soft power of the European Union was far more powerful and more effective. American hard power ain't what it used to be, and I don't know that uh, it, we're going to, particularly after their adventures in Iraq and um, Afghanistan, that um, the Congress will allow any administration to take the same route again. But, but um, uh, European soft power is what we are looking at. And it has been an enormously successful phenomenon in the enlargement of the European Union. Um, since, uh, I suppose I should make a, a, re a relevant remark about, also since we're talking about what made the process and what made this magnetism successful. There was a, an accepted doctrine that reform and democracy were linked with prosperity. This was, this was accepted right across the board. And coming out of these debates with the Atkins Fellows, I can tell you, they now question really whether reforms 
and the type of democracy we have can lead to a sustained prosperity because they look to our recession, they look to certain, um, they don't have to come to Dublin to know that things are not exactly working out the way we thought they would. Um, and so th there's, a, there's an added problem, I think, for the southern neighborhood policy in that there is a, a doubt about whether this link between uh, democracy and reform and, and prosperity is still so evident. Um, I believe we can get around that, but that's, that's, I just mentioned that as a factor. It's a new factor uh, as we see. But to mention the second aspect of the, uh, the, I think the most successful was certainly enlargement. And the second was, let's call it the Eastern neighborhood. Um, which uh, regrettably has been somewhat disappointing, and, but they will tell you, and I'll come back to this point later on, that a, a key problem has been the inability to offer membership, a membership perspective to these countries, to the six countries in the, in the Eastern Partnership, or we, what we are now called um, um, the uh, EAP. But um, the third aspect which we want to discuss here is the Southern uh, Partnership. And here there is a, a most unfortunate legacy because of our failure to uh, pay attention to the nature of the regimes we were working with. Um, and uh, this now comes back to some extent to haunt us. The events in North Africa, therefore, have shifted the focus uh, of the European Union uh, to the southern dimension. Um, and we've had two very interesting communications from the Commission. In March, we had the Partnership for Democracy and Shared Prosperity, which was an interesting document. But I recommend, and I'm no doubt, Ron, your working party will be looking at what we call the review, which came out on the 25th of May. And this is, they called it a new response to a changing neighborhood. Now, um, it's all the usual things are there, the building blocks, uh, you know, for democracy institutions, rule of law, uh, um, um, human rights uh, and, and uh, civil society promotion and so forth. But there's a totally new uh, emphasis on the next generation and a, 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 a number of new uh, elements. The most interesting for me is the creation of the European um, Endowment for Democracy. This is, they said quite clearly, his, and Cathy Ashton at the, at the press conference said, this is based on the American model of the American Endowment for Democracy. And those of us who've worked in the field know how effective the two wings of that have been the National Democratic Institute and the Republican equivalent Republican Institute. And those of us who are working in countries like Georgia and Armenia and out there, the work that they did was far more effective, in my view, than a lot of our programs um, because they were working to help create political parties. They were quite blunt about financing political parties that we would never, never have done. But they also were at very much at the coal face of, we were working on things like constitution and all that, but they had much more freedom. The idea that Cathy Ashton explained is to have a much more aligned, much more like the American Endowment for Democracy. And this, this will be a new instrument. And it goes ahead with another new instrument called the Civil Society Facility. Uh, these are new elements. Uh, um, I uh, will come back to talk about some detail a little bit later, but I noticed that the budgetary arrangements are per perhaps as generous as you can expect or what the Commission is asking for. Um, is it the current budget for the uh, European Neighbourhood Policy is 5.7 billion between now and the uh, end of 2013, and they would add, propose to add a, a further 1.25 billion to this and uh, an additional one billion to address urgent needs in the uh, Southern Partnership. And um, the EIB will, is putting together six billion 
Um, and as you know, the EBRD now is uh, uh, enlarging, they're changing the mandate of the EBRD, so the EBRD would also operate in the Southern Partnership. Um, this is a swing of the pendulum in incremental development of European neighborhood policy. Um, I'll be very brief about the history of where we are. Um, what has happened up to now in the southern policy has not been up, up to expectations. I recall you, I bring back to your mind, 2008, when France proposed the setting up of the Union for the Mediterranean, the UFM. Um, this was followed fairly quickly by the Polish-Swedish uh, uh, initiative of the Eastern Partnership. Um, in fact, in terms of substance, the, the, what is being proposed now in these two documents uh, that I refer to is a sort of a step back for the Eastern Partnership because what is most of what was there, not all, but most of it, uh, has been on offer to the Eastern Partnership. Uh, deeper economic integration, free trade, mo mobility partnerships, come to that again later, but democracy building. But it didn't, they didn't take to it. They, they, they didn't respond, except I'll come back to Moldova as perhaps the one example. But the, the, and perhaps I think with the Polish presidency coming in, this emphasis that we all talk about these days about the Southern Partnership, I think there will be a redress of that to, to some, some extent. The Commission, um, I think that the, the, everybody in Brussels certainly seemed to favor uh, a single policy instrument, and one can see the advantages of that. It uh, makes the EU more visible, it, it's, um, uh, it harmonizes what's on offer. Um, it, very importantly, and I can tell you for those working in the field, the action plans provide a sort of reform agenda, and that, that was extremely important, uh, I always felt, to, to, to those who were working in this area. And, and, and um, it's still the, it, the, the arguments there are still, I think, valid about trying to have a more or less single policy initiative. But with the emphasis now in the southern uh, neighborhood is going to be on political reform, conditionality, and what we call differentiation, so that each country will have a very differentiated, um, dif 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 differentiated uh, um, uh, agreement. And with a lot of flexibility, if you see, going through this excellent paper. By the way, the, the paper of the 25th of May is full of interesting ideas, and it's, I'm sure you probably will spend, be very interested to see your analysis of it. Um, now, what are the problems? And I suppose let's list a couple of the problems. The conditionality criteria here are not very well specified. Um, I suppose it's very difficult to do so. But it speaks of suspension for those who fail to reform. And this is a thing which in the, uh, our game we call positive and negative conditionality. And I noticed, and if you'll allow me, I will read from the paper of the Commission, which says, the EU will curtail relations with governments engaged in violations of human rights and democratic standards, including by making use of targeted sanctions mm -hmm. and other measures. Where it takes such measures, it will not only uphold, but further support civil society, and at the same time apply a, differenti a differentiated approach which will keep open the channels of dialogue with the governments, civil society, and other stakeholders. This, in my submission, is a totally new departure in neighborhood policy. And I don't know how those who have to manage this thing are going to work positive and negative conditionality. It's, to my mind, it's a new concept, and those in the field who are trying to apply this new concept, I think, will find it very, very difficult. That's a, a problem, I, I would signal. Another aspect of the, of the paper is that it doesn't deal with attitude towards Islamic parties. I suppose we all hope that um, they, uh, Arab League and so forth will move in a, in a, in a, in a Turkish direction rather than another direction, but uh, it, it doesn't seem to go with that. Another problem, I think, might be the notion that is through the whole paper of more for more. This is that you get more um, support 
uh, those who reform more will get more financial support. Um, this has, its, of course, it is a good, an interesting concept, but it has its flaws. It will work, I would suggest, in Moldova, uh, where, where there's a, a, a willingness and a wish to reform, and they, they, they will, they, it will be a good incentive there. But it would be no incentive at all to a country like Azerbaijan, who just laugh and think it was a joke because they're so rich, um, and, and um, they wouldn't be interested. And then there's another aspect, um, the Palestinian Authority. Palestinian Authority, in my submission, is already a full partner of the European neighborhood policy. And the funding of the authority will have to continue regardless of the democratic def deficit there for purely for political reasons. Uh, and, and so it's the more for more and the, and the positive negative conditionality. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how all that works. And it's hard to see, uh, I don't know if um, other practitioners in this room, it's hard to see how it's all going to work out. But there again, there's a political reality which we must refer to is that all the European neighborhood states reforms depend on the political will of the governments who are in power and the, and the ruling elites in those countries. And they will want, above all, to remain in power. And that's, that it, it, it's persuading the political <coughs> elites to, to move in this direction is going to be the, uh, one, of the, one of the great tasks. I want to refer to the disappointment in the European neighborhood, the Eastern neighborhood policy. Um, these are the six countries who I don't have to name. And this, all of them have shown a regression on uh, governance, democracy, human rights. Um, uh, except with the exception of Moldova, in my opinion. Um, and in the Southern Partnership, if you apply something not quite the same criteria, only Morocco seems to have made major efforts um, towards reform. You can say, looking at the Eastern Partnership, uh, that there's been progress, a limited economic re re progress on economic reform, but a near total failure in demo demo democracy promotion. The French proposal for the uh, Union for Mediterranean, that tanked very early on, but there were unusual circumstances. As we all know, there was the is, is, Israeli uh, war on Gaza. Uh, there was um, uh, an, a, a difficulty including Israel in the whole mission, the whole of operation, um, a very, very hard to hold. So you remember, ministerial meetings weren't possible. It really got nowhere and became a vehicle for just bilateral national national policies. Um, now I'd mention one other thing about the legacy that we're dealing with. The EU and I referred to it a little bit earlier on, but the EU and the US legacy of. Uh, which we have to live down and work around are our relations with the dictatorships we were supporting. Uh, and uh, it's uh, probably easier for us to get around this uh, than for the United States. Um, and a further, further remark, I, I want to get back to the other thing, but, but a further, further remark about the Eastern uh, Partnership. It's very very, uh, everyone says, you know, if only they had a membership perspective, um, they'd have, um, we, they, they, they'd have, everything would have worked rather as it did with enlargement. Um, I have worked in some of those countries, and frankly, I don't think even with a membership perspective uh, that it would have made any difference because they were not prepared to move in a reforming direction. And it's not just we talk about Russia, uh, but uh, they've all had, uh, they've all regressed towards more authoritarian type re re regimes. Now, uh, <coughs> there's a, a valid criticism, I think, of the uh, Eastern Partnership, and see how it applies uh, to the South, is that finality was never very clear 
um, you know, um, to share everything with institutions was fairly vague. Uh, um, uh, uh, and I think if what we're going to try to do now is to avoid the mistakes made in the Eastern Partnership, um, we need to clarify the end game. We'd want to avoid the obvious mistakes. I consider one of the great mistakes in the early years of our relations with Russia was the personalizing of the relationship with Yeltsin um, because he had, it was a spent force from a very early stage. And I don't think that helped because we weren't able to condemn the corrupt privatizations that took place, etc. So there's an awful lot to learn. And those of us who've been in the field dealing with projects, there was an awful lot to learn from the management of projects. And um, when I was leaving um, Georgia, I had an interesting session with, with uh, Shevardnadze, and I sat down and I listed all the projects the EU had done over five and a half years. There were an enormous number. An enormous number of consultants had been employed at enormous expense. And I said to him, President, look, uh, look, here we are. There's one or two here that have worked, but all the others, they're all dead. What, 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 how, what do you feel of that? He said, oh, well, you know. So, so. But it, it, it was a problem that they, we have a lot to learn from our failures in Eastern Partnership and, and, in the, um, and, and in our relations with these countries because we, um, we perhaps were much too optimistic that uh, reforms would, would be sustainable. Um, and, and, of course, the um, corruption came and other ele elements came and dis disrupted that. Um, so I think, um, to come back to the clarify the end game, I think in the new arrangements, the goal will have to be clear, and it has to be, in my opinion, association. It has to lead to a clear association and it has to be um, a structured relationship with these uh, southern, Af southern countries, whether be it in Middle East or, um, or North Africa. And it has to be with a time frame. And we have to try to get our heads around a very new and dramatic situation. Um, we have to fight for your EU coherence in regard to this. The big problems I've referred to already are the targeting of this assistance uh, and the difficulty of providing more money at a time of budget restrictions. May I ask, try to answer the question, why is the Southern Partnership important? I would give two, two immediate responses. One is that our security depends on our neighborhood in our southern neighborhood. But also, uh, prosperity depends on the, the, our relations with our southern neighborhood. I'd go so far as to say that their prosperity, their economic success, is our security. I'll just take one, one, one figure out of the sky, because uh, it, it struck me immediately when I read this. We're talking about 800 million people in the, in the, in the neighborhood. The population of the Arab League at the moment is 280 million. And the estimate is that within 15 years, that will nearly double to over 500 million. And an amazing article the other day that I read said that recent opinion polls are showing that more than 50% these, well, first of all, more than half this, uh, this population is going to be under 25 in 15 years' time. But that 50% of the youth want to emigrate. Now, if we fail to create economic growth in the southern neighborhood and, 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 and have real development there, there's there's actually an enormous potential to destabilize our own countries. Now, we know all the debate that goes on about managed immigration, and we are not uh, really handling it very well. I know it's become awfully political with 
right-wing and um, xenophobic parties on the growth in a lot of countries, not just the Netherlands and Finland and, 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 and elsewhere, but, and maybe wait till the next vote in France. Uh, um, but it's, it's, it's uh, managed immigration is, is absolutely fundamental, but we will not be able to manage it if we don't deal with the economic development of our southern neighborhood countries. The watchwords, as I said, political reform, but also economic <coughs> development. And we can't not afford to address the economies of the southern neighborhood. One consoling and surprising uh, figure as well is that the European Union disperses half of the world's development assistance. This figure surprised me. But now it's all a question of how the, what priorities we use in that exercise and how we target it and whether we can use the mistakes of the past not to make them again. Um, a little bit of political weather forecasting before I close. Um, what can we expect in the political weather forecast? Well, I suppose there are a few obvious things you can say. Um, a more democratic Middle East um, and a more democratic North, North, Afri North Africa is going to be more unpredictable. It will be more unstable. Democracy is noisy, but it's more endurable. It, we, we know it's more endurable. Um, but we'll have to live with whatever comes out of this and, and do our best to, to, uh, to work with whatever comes out of it. Another reflection, and I think in Washington, the beginning to, 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 to realize this and recognize it, US influence is likely to be in much declined, um, the, not just in the Arab-Israeli peace process, that's another, another day, that's another lecture, um, but in a whole lot of other things in regard to nuclear, Iran. Um, but take an example of Egypt, which is now, of course, in the grip of um, the expectations of the Arab street and the success of, of people, people power. There's a strong anti-American feeling among these people, and it's very, it runs very deep. They haven't at all the same anti-Iranian feelings as they have as anti-American. Um, the United States is likely to follow Europe in having a policy towards that part of the world which is more value-based. Um, and Hillary Clinton has already indicated this in a number of, of interviews. And this creates, um, will create a new situation for America's relations with a number of its present allies, important allies. Take, for example, Saudi. The Saudi, for good reason, are, reasons, are begun, beginning to feel threatened by this and by the whole development uh, locally. I was intrigued to see that the, the elements of many closer contacts between Saudi and China and I can see, as one possible consequence of this, is that there will be a new alliance between Saudi and China. Saudi would certainly build its further close relations with the Arab monarchies. And then there's the, the question of Syria, which is probably the most difficult, and maybe the one that survives longer than, than a lot of the others, uh, because it's very, uh, Syria is in a very strange position because the West, uh, or the Western community has virtually no influence there. Uh, and I, you know how difficult sanctions will be and all that. Um, but, um, and I was also intrigued to see that Iraq and Iran have reached agreement to have a military alliance. Um, this is, I can understand this from a Shiite point of view, but it's also, a very fascinating prospect that the um, Iran-trained military, American-trained military, is going to provide a very good complement. The Iraq, sorry, 
Iraq-trained American military is going to provide a very interesting complement to, to Iran's military capacity. Um, it's a very new world. And we had a very interesting experience at King's College because, uh, with Turkey, because Turkey, I suppose, and I would submit to you, is going to become the most important strategic regional power in that part of the world. And when, uh, about a couple, few months after that, the foreign minister, um, Ahmed Davatoglu, was, uh, became foreign minister, he came and gave us a keynote lecture. He came to my institute at King's. And it was very, very fascinating because he set up a totally new agenda for Turkey. Um, and it's, we, we know some of the basic things, of course, um, um, no problems with our neighbors and, and so on. But what was very interesting is that he can see, um, people said he was trying to restore the Ottoman Empire, but he, can, he could see that Turkey is in a key central position to influence developments in that part of the world. And I think Turkey should be the main ally of, of the European Union in that area because they have tremendous power and they want to see a secular and democratic, uh, well, secular, I want to I qualify that a bit, but they want to see free democratic um, systems of government in the neighboring countries. And they're very interested in the prosperity of the neighboring countries. And they are a big player because this European neighborhood policy in the South operates in a very complex strategic <coughs> environment. You have the interests of Russia to the north, and you have still the interests of the United States in the region, particularly to the south. Um, so it's, uh, um, I think, Turkey we have to uh, consider as um, one of the most interesting players, and now reinforced after the elections, of course, they are much more confident on where they're going, and um, um, much less uh, um, looking towards the European Union, though it's still part of their policy to try to achieve membership. But we, I think, need uh, to build on the ideas of a strategic partnership with Turkey, um, and it, it should have, really then, have everything in it but membership, if we can move in that direction. But it's more important to have a, a, a political strategic partnership with Turkey and all that that entails. And one I'm not going to deal with is Libya because nobody knows what's going to happen there and it could have serious consequences for NATO, which is already no longer a working alliance in the real sense. As we, my colleagues call it a bag of clubs. Um, it's no longer, Article 5 doesn't work there anymore, and, and uh, NATO d doesn't even take a similar position. It didn't even take a, a, um, a similar position in the United Nations on Libya. Um, and uh, frankly, they say it's a bag of clubs. You can find a club for Afghanistan, another club for Libya. And, and, uh, but I mean, I wouldn't like to be Rasmussen. I think he has a, he has a very difficult job there. Now, what is the challenge to the European Union? Um, I think the biggest danger and the biggest thing to avoid is a political vacuum. Put, put simply, the problems of the southern neighborhood are for Europe, not for the United States. It's closer to Europe. It's, it's, we're more interdependent. Um, our interests are more immediate. Uh, um, and uh, we have different strategic interests. Um, so we have to assume the responsibility, I think, for, our, for, for the southern neighborhood policy. We can't. There's no one else who can do it. And I always will remain an optimist, and I think we should all try to be an optimist, optimist about post-Lisbon Brussels. I know we all know the procedures are slow. There's a lack of a sense of urgency in, in when we even see whether, how our, these excellent proposals are going to be processed. There is a lack of a sense of urgency. And so far, regrettably, there's no sign so far that um, uh, this political vacuum is going to be met and that the European Union can meet the challenge. But I hope I'm wrong in that assessment. Um, we need to move on, if possible, from the crises within Europe of the euro and Schengen. And, and 
what everyone talks about nowadays is the crisis in leadership. Well, I suppose it is very true. But we must face some ways of getting around this crisis of leadership and this crisis of solidarity, as we see with the, with the euro, but let's hope it's going to be different this week with Greece. Um, look, um, if Germany is no longer the motor of integration, the future then must depend on finding other medium and small size states of Europe to take the place of the original um, in motor for integration. I think we all hope, and everyone hopes, that Germany will remain the motor for economic integration and, ec uh, the, and, and on the economy. But there are a lot of other areas where I think we can look to medium-sized and small-sized countries. Most interesting is Poland, and the next, that's the next presidency of the European Union. Um, we had some very interesting meetings in London with um, the Polish foreign, foreign minister, Rasław Sierkowski, <coughs> who uh, is a very extremely pro-European character with very, very good ideas. And it, I think the Polish presidency will be a very active and fascinating one. And I think we're going to get a, a lot of leadership from the Polish presidency that's just come coming up. Um, so let's not be pessimistic. There are a lot of forces against, uh, uh, the, the negative forces are, 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 are very evident, but I don't think we should indulge in pessimism. Lisbon was uh, structured so that we could build a bigger boat, we were told, a bigger and better boat, more fit for purpose. And look, if Lisbon is as good as it gets, we just have to work with it, and we have to work harder with it. <laughs> we have no other choice. Um, and an awful lot depends, I think, on a number of factors. Well, there's the um, external action service. Uh, you, um, David O'Sullivan spoke to you um, last January, and he was gave a very interesting um, uh, Out, outlined his, the challenges facing him. Uh, I have to say in this audience here, one must admire uh, the likes of um, David Sullivan and Catherine and others who, who have really made such a big impact in the, in the European in Commission in particular and, uh, and others and other institutions. And I admire David's courage <laughs> in taking on this task. But you know, simply it just has to succeed. I mean, there's, there's no, no alternative. It has to succeed. Um, and um, uh, I re remind you that the three great challenges he said in his speech was, <coughs> one was neighborhood. The next challenge is the Middle East peace process, or Middle East peace. And the third was the, 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 to project European interests in the new global order, the new global... Uh, the new global world, the new global order of economic and political giants, you know, and, and this is to project Europe in that world, Europe and European interests in that world of the United States, of China, and of India. Um, it's, uh, there's an enormous task there, but I want to sum up. Um, the European Union has a stark choice in its neighborhood. It's either to be in the vanguard uh, of change or again be behind the curve and on the wrong side of history. I think the events in North Africa particularly have demonstrated this challenge uh, and it's the challenge to develop a clear strategy. Um, it must rise to the The EU must rise to this. It's a historical challenge um, um, by any proportions. It must rise to the challenge of its neighborhood. Um, as I said, we have to avoid the mistakes of the past. And we have to um, give a priority to the uh, political and financial, those political and financial priorities which are required to build a safe and prosperous southern neighborhood. And I think uh, it uh, would be a great disaster for all of our countries if we fail to do so. But the challenge is quite enormous. And I'll stop there, and I look forward to the discussion.